Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, to the end of the chapter. The workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Amen. Uh, we could quite easily be depressed, couldn't we, when we, if we sat down and thought for any length of time about the spiritual state of our society. So there's less people attending church than there was 40, 50 years ago. Uh, church buildings are being sold off, often at the highest bidder. Uh, there are more liberal attitudes to sex and gender, even amongst those who would call themselves Christians. And there are scandals involving church leaders uh, across various denominations. We could quite easily just look at all that and feel just a bit, you know, you know the met emoji, a bit like, Meh, this is ridiculous. Um, we could also quite easily feel very overwhelmed as we then look at the community around us, the local community, and think of the problems in it. So we could look and go, well, there's widespread drug use, uh, alcohol dependency, broken homes, domestic violence, knife crime, interest in the occult, people who would rather consult mediums or place crystals in bedrooms to bring harmony than look to Jesus. And when we see all that, when we see people who are lost, and when we see them all searching in the wrong places for answers, hopeless and helpless, in the face of all that life seems to throw at them, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is our response? What's our response to that? Is it despair? So it could quite easily be despair, I think. Is it disgust? Is it denial? Do we just pretend that it's not all like that? What do we think Jesus' response to all of that is. Since we rejoined Matthew's Gospel just over a month or so ago, we've seen a load of things. Uh, Matthew's recorded uh, little triplets of stories with something usually in between about discipleship since chapter, the beginning of chapter 8. So we saw a leper, a centurion, and Peter's mother-in-law healed, followed by other general healings, with a section then that kind of bridged the gap before the next set of three that was all about the cost of discipleship. What was, what was going to be the cost of following Jesus? Then we saw Jesus calm a storm, free two demon-possessed men, and cure a paralysed man while proclaiming that his sins were forgiven. That was then followed by a little interlude that was about Jesus calling a tax collector, which was a surprise, and giving a rebuke to the Pharisees for their lack of mercy towards sinful people. And then last week, Matthew took us through the raising of the dead girl, the healing of the woman with the bleeding problem, and the story of sight being given to the blind and speech being given to the mute. Now, in all of that, Jesus' power and compassion have been clearly coupled together by Matthew as he's pieced these stories together, not in a chronological order, but in an order that shows and makes that big point. Jesus' compassion and power have been uh, front and centre Jesus fulfilling uh, the promises made about the Messiah have been there for all to see. Jesus has quite obviously been a human being, but also God at the same time. And as we get to the end of chapter 9, Jesus fulfills another role, and we'll think about what that is in a minute. But verse 35 acts like a little bit of a summary. As Matthew pointed out last week, there's a bit of a summary in 4.23. There's a bit of a summary here in 9.35 of what Jesus has been doing. He's been travelling all over the place, through towns and villages. He's been constantly on the move. He's been teaching. He's been preaching the gospel. And he has healed all kinds of illnesses and diseases and sicknesses. Jesus' mission is clear. Jesus' power is clear. And then that brings us to verse 36, once again, where crowds have gathered round Jesus. The crowds can't get enough of Jesus. Maybe they want to hear his wise teaching. Maybe they're hoping that today will be the day they see a miracle, whatever it might be. 
Whatever it is, Jesus basically isn't getting a moment's peace, is he? Everywhere he goes, people follow him. Even when he's at his friend's house, or his friend's mother's house, people are waiting outside, desperate for him to come out and heal them. He gets no rest, no peace. But look at his response to the people. It says, Jesus had compassion on them. Compassion on them. He was full of compassion. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, were supposed to shepherd the people. They were supposed to look after them. They were supposed to point them to God. They were supposed to help them see how they were to live while they waited for the promised Messiah to come. But they'd failed. They'd failed miserably. We've seen a few ways they failed. They wouldn't entertain the tax collectors. They wouldn't speak with the sinners. They wouldn't mix with them. They were selfish, really. They wanted their own... um, reputation to be enhanced they looked down on other people particularly people who they thought weren't behaving the way they were supposed to behave they delighted in rules and regulations but lacked any true love for God and as a result of that they then lacked any desire to be merciful to people in this case if they'd been surrounded by all these people without having a break they'd have just have found a way to get rid of them But isn't it wonderful that Jesus, although he has travelled constantly and been surrounded by people constantly demanding his time and his efforts, that his response is still a response of compassion. Jesus' heart here aches for these people. And I think if we're honest, we wouldn't respond like Jesus does, would we? Jesus said, I can't go anywhere without being stopped. People are begging him for help, begging him for healing, but he doesn't get sick and tired of it. Jesus keeps giving of himself to the people who need him. He keeps loving. He keeps acting in grace and mercy. He keeps on showing compassion even to the worst of sinners. See, I imagine we probably get frustrated when our plans get interrupted, even by our friends, never mind by random people or people we don't like. We become irritable, don't we, when we don't get a minute to ourselves. How often he said, I haven't had a minute to myself. If I could just have a bit of my own time, it'll be okay. Sadly, we are not full of compassion like Jesus. Jesus operates on a completely different level to us. Which is not surprising. The Bible says God's ways are so much higher than ours, aren't they? And that's in every respect. We might have people from church round for a takeaway and we might chat about life. We might catch up with our mates on Sunday. We might rejoice with them. We might even weep with them. We might struggle, and we might welcome, sorry, somebody who is struggling or somebody who is new. We might offer to pray with them. And all of those things are good to do. But when was the last time we loved a stranger? Because actually, the root of, although this is not about hospitality, but about compassion towards people, the word for hospitality in the New Testament comes from the root word, which is about love of strangers. When was the last time we had a bunch of people over to our house that we don't like? When was the last time we made the first move towards somebody we would think, man, that person is just lost, broken, sinful, really? When was the last time we moved towards them first? As Jesus does repeatedly in the Gospels, full of compassion. I think if we're honest with ourselves, deep down we struggle with compassion. When we see the way Jesus is compassionate, we think, man, I'm not sure I can do that. If we're honest, we like to show kindness on our own terms. Or we like to help other people when it fits with our timetable. If there's a knock on the door when we're curled up on the sofa having me time in our pyjamas, we don't want to answer the door, do we? We definitely don't want it to be somebody who's needy if we do answer the door. But isn't it wonderful that when we see Jesus, when he finds needy people, lost people, broken people, hurting people he cares for them isn't it good news that jesus doesn't look out and see murderer addict criminal scammer liar cheat but jesus sees sheep without a shepherd it's good news for us as much as it is for anybody else because we are desperately needy people We might look at the world and see and think that it is desperately needy and it is but the reality is we are desperately needy Without Jesus, we are in the same boat. 
And Jesus sees us as we are and shows us compassion. Isn't it wonderful then as well that we, we, need, we can remember and, and know that we're not on the clock when it comes to Jesus. When we come to Jesus with our needs, he's not sat there going, right? You've got 30 seconds. Sorry, time up. You'll have to come back tomorrow. He just doesn't do that, does he? We're not on the clock with Jesus. It's good news that we don't have to sort ourselves out before we come to Jesus. He doesn't say, hold on a minute, how have you done today? Compared to these five criteria, sorry, you can't come in today. Come back tomorrow, try again. Isn't it good news is that Jesus meets us in our utter mess and lifts us out of it? Do we realise that Jesus views us this way with compassion? Do we realise as Christians that Jesus still views us compassion with us, views us with compassion even when we sin? So Jesus doesn't shake our heads, shake his heads at us when we stumble and fall into sin. He comes and he picks us up. Jesus' heart goes out to us because Jesus doesn't want us to sin. He saved us from sin. And he knows that what is best for us is to come to him, to know him, to run back to him. And so he stands with open arms to welcome us back to him. A pastor friend of mine said, as I was listening to something this week, said the following statement. If God judged us the way we judge other people, we'd all be in hell now. If God judged us the way we judge other people, we'd all be in hell now. Because we judge quickly, man. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus is patient. These chapters through up to this point, and including this bit here, as Jesus speaks about the... Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. It shows us that there is nobody who is too lost. For Jesus, nobody who is too hopeless or helpless, nobody who is too far gone, nobody who is so deep in darkness that Jesus cannot rescue them. Jesus is the good shepherd. These people are sheep without a shepherd, but now the shepherd is here. The true shepherd has come to lead and to care for and to protect his people. And in light of that truth, in light of who Jesus is and the great compassion we see Jesus have, verses 37 are then a statement from Jesus and a command from Jesus. Jesus tells his disciples that there is a harvest, that there are people out there ready to hear the gospel and respond to it in repentance and faith. But there's one problem. The harvest is there, but there aren't many workers to gather the harvest in. Now, we've got to be careful here because we can't specifically say that there'll be loads of people on this estate or even in our town or our region that are ready to hear the gospel and respond in repentance and faith. We can't say specifically, right, there's a hundred people in Ardwick, let's go and find them. Because we don't know that for certain. There might only be one. There might be 7,000. They might be all chosen to be saved, but we don't know. Jesus is making this broad statement that there is in general, and we know this is true, that in general there is a mismatch between the number of people who need to hear the gospel and the number of people who are out telling them the gospel. There's a mismatch. One is large and the other is small. And we know it's true. Think about the world. Think about the number of tribes that are still unreached with the gospel. You want to go and find out how many there are? Go to a website called The Joshua Project. You can see a list. There's thousands. Think about the countries in the 1040 window. Those in geography, that's 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north of the equator. And in that band that runs around the earth, there are very few Christians. Think about countries in Europe. There are still countries in Western Europe, which would be seen as, or would have traditionally been seen as more of a a Christian continent, so to speak. There are countries in Europe that have less than 1% evangelical Christians. In England, there are towns with no evangelical churches. And in our estate, there are 7,000 people and less than 20 evangelical believers. And yet we know, as we read earlier, which was great that Philip had this read out in uh, Revelation 19, there will be a multitude in heaven from every tongue, tribe, nation and language worshipping worshiping God. So while we can't be specific about who exactly is going to be saved or the numbers of people near us or on our street or in our estate who will be saved, we can be confident that there will be people from all over the world 
who will be saved. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus says, but the workers are few. And so, yes, like I said at the beginning, we could become very depressed when we think about the scale of the task. But then what we should do is definitely hear Jesus' words and ask, what is the solution to the problem? Wonderfully, Jesus' command that follows the statement gives the answer. Look at verse 38. So the harvest is plentiful, loads over here, the workers are few, small amount of people over here. What's the answer? Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus tells his followers to speak to the Lord of the harvest and ask him to send out workers. Well, the first thing that tells us is this, isn't it? That God is sovereign over the harvest. God is sovereign over the harvest. It is his. He will save people. He will bring in that harvest. He will bring people from darkness to light. He will rescue hopeless people and give them hope. He will rescue helpless people and give them life. And God is sovereign also over the calling and ascending of the workers into that harvest field. So we need to pray to him. See, asking God to send out workers into the harvest field and save people, in reality then, because of Jesus' command, should be a regular feature of our prayers. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is it? Is it a regular feature of our prayers? In the past, I've, I've not done this very well, I've done it once recently, but only once in, I don't know how long. Wandered round our estate to pray. And I've prayed specifically for people to move into particular streets and particular blocks. You might think that's a bit mental. Well, not if Jesus' command here is a good command to follow. It's probably a good thing to do. I should do it more often. It should be a regular, not just because if I'm walking, it helps stir my mind though as I'm walking past particular places thinking, well, I don't know of any Christians who live in this block of the estate. And so I've prayed for people to move there. Interestingly enough, God has answered some of those prayers, not all of them, but some of them, in a, in a positive way. We need people here on the estate, in the community, to reach it. There are churches all over our region who need people and leaders in particular, or pastors. Browning Avenue, no pastor. Aircliffe Evangelical Church, no pastor. Calvary Christian Fellowship Church in Sunderland, currently, no pastor. Spen Valley Church, only two elders and 11 church members. Grace Church, Goncaster, one elder. Are we praying for God to raise up the people to fill in those gaps? To build those churches so they can reach out more effectively to the places that they are? Are we praying for God to develop men and women of godly character? Men and women who will sacrifice the pleasures of this world and instead spend themselves for the glory of God? Are we praying for men and women who will shun worldly reputation to live in obscurity? I don't think we can overestimate the need that there is. I don't think that's possible. I also don't think we can overplay the importance of Jesus' words here. Anyway, so we're actually Matt, praying for workers in the harvest field is something I do quite often. It's something God convicted me of a long time ago and I pray for that regularly. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe we are regularly praying for the lost. The question is, if that's the case, are we praying earnestly for that? Is there a holy desperation in us? Do we pray with a deep desire from our hearts? And if not, if that has grown cold, I guess the question we've got to ask is why? There could be a few reasons. The first is, we could be ignorant of the command of Jesus. Maybe this verse is unfamiliar or we'd forgotten it. So maybe we're ignorant of, the, of that command from Jesus. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send words in the harvest field. Maybe we were just weren't aware of the need. Maybe for some reason we hadn't really thought about it. But actually, statistics, I mean, statistics maybe aren't our thing. We don't like looking at numbers. But now we have heard Jesus' command and we know some of the numbers, we've kind of we've got rid of those two possibilities. If it's still a struggle, I think the reason we probably don't do it is this. I think it's because we lack a compassion for the lost. That's why I don't pray it so often. It's a lack of compassion for the lost. Most likely the problem is a selfishness in me or a complacency in me or a part of me that just simply prefers ease and comfort. Whereas Jesus is full of compassion and love and that is what propels him towards people. 
So maybe we first need to take a step back before we get to Jesus' instruction in prayer here and pray for ourselves that we would have a greater compassion for the lost. Pray for a heart that loves Jesus more and as a result of loving Jesus more, then loves people more like Jesus. Second though, we need to look at the context of the prayer. The Pharisees, as I said, and the Jewish leaders, they'd failed in their task of shepherding God's people. They'd failed to point the people to God. And immediately after this, chapter, the beginning of chapter 10, which I'm not going to steal Graham's thunder from next week, but immediately at the beginning of chapter 10, what does Jesus do? He calls the 12 and gives them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and illness. Then we get the names of the 12, and then they basically get sent out. So Jesus has just said, loads of people need to hear the gospel, but there's not many people to go and do it. Ask God to send them out. And then what does he do? He calls them and sends them out. They're the answer to the prayer. They themselves, part of that group who Jesus gives this command to, are the answer to the prayer. Jesus, the true shepherd, is going to make sure the sheep are found and he sends out workers into the harvest fields. See, taking the call to prayer that Jesus gives here is one thing, and it is a good thing. But we can do that anywhere. The comfort of our own home, sat in our armchair with a cup of coffee, huddled together in church. And we should be doing that. But there's also a call to go, and that's maybe a different kettle of fish. Is it that actually, as we... We're hopefully convicted by God to pray this prayer more often that we find, you know what, I'm actually the answer to my own prayers. I am the answer to my own prayers. Am I willing to then be the answer to my own prayers? Am I ready to move? To change jobs? To step out of my comfort zone in obedience to Jesus? Are we the ones who are then called to speak to our neighbours? Are we the ones who are supposed to be the answer to some of my prayers to live somewhere on this estate? Are we the ones who are being called to a short-term mission like we thought about already, as these guys shared at the front earlier? Maybe some of us are called to be part of a new church plant. Not necessarily a one that we plant as a church, but another one that we're connected with. Medhurst are looking at trying to help uh, restart a church in Eston. Maybe even we don't, maybe we think further than this. Maybe for some of us, what God will lay in our heart is actually we're supposed to go to Mongolia or India or Paraguay or Zambia or Antarctica or whatever it might be. Maybe, maybe as we pray, that's where God will call us to. See, the Lord of the harvest is sovereign. But that same sovereign Lord has ordained that the means by which the gospel will go out is through the preaching of of people. Romans 10. Listen to the progression in Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Great. So they need, uh, they, they can call on God's name and they can be saved. Great. How then will they call on the one they've not believed in? Ah, right. And how can they then uh, believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see the progression? Ties in with Jesus' prayer here, doesn't it? People need to hear the gospel, lots of them. Not many people there to go. What's the answer? Pray that God would raise up more people than they would go. Or what about 1 Corinthians 1, 21 to 25? For since the wisdom of, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. It's not about whether we're articulate or clever or charismatic as we speak and can gather a crowd it's it's about the message of Christ crucified think back to when you were saved think back to how the Lord brought you if you're a Christian to himself I can guarantee you two things 
One, somebody prayed for you. And two, somebody told you the gospel. Absolute guarantee. You might not know who they were. Well, you probably know the person who told you the gospel, but you might not know the people who prayed for you, but I can guarantee you that for every single one of us who is sat here as a Christian tonight, somebody prayed for us and somebody told us the gospel. Somebody prayed for you, prayed for your town, prayed for your country, and you were the answer to God's prayers. Someone in your life read the Bible to you or with you. Somebody took you along to church so you could hear a preacher. Somebody chatted with you about life and pointed you to Jesus, the answer of your biggest needs. Somebody stepped out in faith and started a youth group. Somebody told you you were a sinner and needed saving, even if that was in a very simple way, as they stumbled over their words and thought they'd made a mess of it. Somebody was bold and courageous and told you their testimony. Somebody moved out of their comfort zone and decided to join the Sunday school teaching team. And if they hadn't done one of any one of those things or a million others, you wouldn't be sat here saved by Jesus. Not because God is not sovereign, but because those people at those times, over the course of many years or even over the course of days or in one instant moment, they were the means God chose to save you. God called them to do it, and however reluctant they were, they did it. Maybe with a huge amount of fear and trepidation, but they did it, and God used that to bring you and I to faith. What a privilege it is, or what a privilege they had to be part of God's plan to save you. What a privilege we still have while we have breath in our lungs to be part of God's plan to save others. So the question is, are we laboring in this way? Are we laboring in this way for our church, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in speaking the gospel or both? Are we playing our part in ministries that we run? Are we using the God-given gifts that we have to talk to people about Jesus? Because ultimately, as human beings, we will commit time to what we believe is important. We will commit time to what we believe is important. And we will talk about what we love. We'll talk about things that matter to us. So like we said, maybe the first thing we need to do is to pray for ourselves. Not in a selfish way, but in a way that says, my heart needs to change so that I can be more like Jesus in this. My heart needs to change so that I'll have a bigger love for and a greater delight in Jesus and a much fuller compassion for people. And when we then do get stuck into the task at hand, whether that's on our knees in prayer or going out into the harvest field, one thing is for certain. The Bible says that our labour for the Lord will not be in vain. We might not see fruit from it in our lifetime. We might have many disappointments. The first five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people we pray for or speak the gospel to might seem interested and walk away or might be outwardly hostile to us, or might just be completely apathetic. But there will be a harvest, and God says, Jesus says here, there will be a plentiful one. And so because God has promised that to us, we can pray with boldness and confidence that the Lord of the harvest will raise up workers and send them out into the harvest field. Might be us, might be other people, but all of us in some way, shape or form have got a part to play in following Jesus' command in verse 38.